Our guest in this segment is the Attorney General of the State of West Virginia, Patrick Morrissey. Patrick, good morning to you, sir. Hey, good morning to all of you. Hope uh, you're enjoying a beautiful day in the eastern panhandle. Are you in the capital? I am uh, here in Charleston, so I am uh, excited for a busy day in the office. And uh, But I, I did have a chance to get up to the eastern panhandle a bit, got back home. It was nice. Uh, went to the South Berkeley Parade and a couple parades in Jefferson County, uh, not last weekend, but the weekend before that. So it's always good to be back home. Very nice. Uh, let's. Uh, I want to start off first with the uh, interim sessions that are going on. Do you ever become a part of those interim sessions, Patrick, for legislation? I think sometimes we do. We have certainly during interims, the legislators stop by pretty regularly in our office. And frequently they'll ask questions about how different things work or whether we can help with drafting or think through some of the problems. Because at the end of the day, their job is to draft the laws. Our job is to defend the laws. So uh, if they're smart, they sit down with some of our team and they get some input. And we welcome that because we want to do it the right way. And we know that over the years that it works much better when people coordinate uh, with the people with the expertise. So uh we, we've had good working relationships with many of the legislature. I think it's resulted in positive things over the years. You have obviously had a lot to do with the opioid settlements in West Virginia. And in our last segment with John Doyle, he brought up uh, lawsuits regarding PFAS, PF, PFAS uh, chemicals and such, and mentioned that uh, you had not signed on to some of those, those lawsuits. Do you have additional information on that, Patrick? No, I, I would say that we are closely reviewing that. We've been doing so. We're all over it. We've been doing so for a while. And, you know, we don't respond to uh, the newspapers or to, you know, random people that just suggest that we should file suits. What we do is we spend a lot of time trying to put West Virginians' interest first. And so it's not always uh, if you can get to the courthouse and file your case, it's knowing the unique nature of your own laws and the facts and what's happened on the ground, but always protecting West Virginia interest. And I can tell you when it came to opioids, uh, there were times when we got out way out in front and there were times that we were strategic and we waited. And as a result, we had many of the top settlements in the country, number one per capita in so many cases, and our total numbers were off the charts. So we handle this right, uh, but we obviously can't talk about all the cases that we're investigating before we act on them. But uh, I think we're proceeding along. We're uh, very much aware of the various issues. I think they're serious issues. Anytime you're talking about forever chemicals, uh, consumers should have a right to know what's going on and have potential solutions uh, to that if you can prove it and if you can come up with ideas that work for the citizens of, of your state. So that's what we're doing on PFAS. I take it very seriously, and uh, I'm sure that people will hear things in the upcoming weeks and months ahead. So you haven't ruled out participating in some of those suits, in other words? No, we haven't ruled anything out yet. So we're closely analyzing, and we've been, in fact, reviewing the Ohio uh, decision. And it's important for people to know that there are different statutes and different laws in place between the states. So, for instance, you know, people pointed out that uh, Kentucky sued and Ohio had done certain things. Well, the attorney general has different sets of authorities in each state. In some states, it's broader. Some states, it's more narrow. So that means that we have to uh, do various consulting. Sometimes you can act independently. Sometimes you work with your state agencies. And sometimes you just want to get the remedy right, especially when you're talking about something that you may not know uh, much about. There's a lot of uncertainty in this area. And while there are certain things that you know about, there's a history in West Virginia. There were, in fact, multiple lawsuits in West Virginia before. There was a class action suit dating back to 2004, and there's been other activity. There's a national suit that West Virginians can participate in. So we've been looking at all that, and that's a difference in some of the other states. Will you be at some point along the way endorsing one of the candidates who's seeking your office as you run for governor? You know, I'm thinking about it. I'm, uh, I view that this is a process and we're watching all the candidates 
and how they're acting and, and their records and what they stand for. So I have not endorsed anyone yet, but I want to make sure that we have a really good successor in there and someone I can work closely with uh, when I serve as the state's next governor. I think it's so critical that the state governor and the attorney general work very closely together because you can accomplish much more when that happens. So I am uh, taking a close look, and uh, I may very well weigh in and endorse, but it's still very early. We're talking five months out before the election, so that's part of the reason why uh, you haven't seen the, the campaign in full swing yet, because voters are just beginning to start to pay attention. And I want to make sure that when they are paying attention, that's when we're going to be uh, at our peak. We've spoken about criminal jurisdiction for your office in the past and how it lacks that for the most part. Uh, Mike Stewart, who is running to be your successor, mentioned early on that he would like criminal jurisdiction for the attorney general's office. He's backed that off a little bit to talking about specific instances of fraud and such to give him more leeway if he was the next attorney general into investigating towards that. Do you at times wish you had additional uh, criminal jurisdiction in your office? Well, look, certainly there's, there have been some cases that we've referred that uh, locals did not act on, and that's very frustrating when you really build a case and you feel very good about uh, the merits of the case and you would go forward and prosecute. But I think overall, I've only asked ever for a very narrow uh, array of criminal prosecutorial power. I think that it's correct that it's lodged in the prosecutor's office, so I'm not an advocate of uh, really taking away uh, very much authority, uh, in fact, taking away any authority from the local prosecutor. I think that they're, for the most part, doing a lot of really good work. And so I'm not going to suggest that the AG's office becomes the prosecutor for the state in all local matters. I do think there are some limited instances where there are some potential conflicts of interest or where there could be uh, some corruption in the state house or other matters that it helps to have someone who has the ability to go in and who's not going to get uh, caught pushing things aside because there might be a local conflict or an issue that they can't address. So uh, I think a very narrow expansion I've always thought is, is appropriate, uh, but certainly uh, we've, we've been pleased. We've worked effectively with uh, just a wide variety of prosecutors. Matt Miller. Uh, Patrick, I want to go back a little bit to, to the, the very beginning uh, as, as Rob asked a question and talked a little bit about kind of the coordinating effort, if you will, between the legislature and the executive branch and their looking at laws and, and addressing your office to make sure of the legalities and so forth. Take us into that relationship a little bit more as far as your office may be monitoring things that are being passed through the legislature. How much do you jump in and and say, hey, guys, I'm not sure that what you just passed is going to pass the, the test or uh, how much is it that you're talking beforehand? And 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 John even mentioned, like in the, the case with the, the PFAS and the um, settlement there in Ohio, that, that the legislature could even, you know, pass law to tell your office that you need to do this. So t take us a little deeper yeah, into that whole all, relationship. I, I don't think that's correct. Okay. I don't think the legislature can do that in terms of a specific case since I'm the AG. So I love John. John's a nice guy, but uh, I don't think that that's correct from a separation of powers perspective. Uh, but I would say this, that we, of course, want to work with folks very closely in terms of uh, the ability to get the best things, the best results done for West Virginia. So, look, most of the time we tell folks we make ourselves available to help. You try not to force yourself on people because they are the legislature. That's their role. I greatly respect their role. That's different than the role of the AG, the same way that uh, we wouldn't want people to Monday morning quarterback the decisions you make as AG. I'm not going to come in and, uh, and hit them for what they're doing on the legislative side. But sometimes it does help to have communications and coordinate and discuss. And so we uh, try to do it. It's not a formal process, but – we want to help, and we always are happy to provide assistance. And uh, I think that there have been a lot of issues over the years where we certainly have. You know, you take the West Virginia First Foundation and the codification of all of the settlements. You know, I was very proud that we wrote that legislation. We wrote it, we submitted it, and 
In fact, uh, the Senate and the House, they accepted it, and they agreed 100 percent. I thought that was very positive, and uh, that was a great working relationship. And quite frankly, I commend all the folks in the Eastern Panhandle uh, for working that through. And uh, you had folks in the Senate and the House say it was important that it get that it get done right, and that's what happened because we drafted it. And uh, so that's an example of something where we went a lot further. But there are other situations where people may uh, pick up the phone and they may call and say. What would happen here? I mean, the Second Amendment issues would be a good example when the uh, issues were pending in terms of the uh, federal overreach. We were able to provide some feedback about that uh, to try to get that done right. And uh, I think we did. Certainly one of the things your office deals with is scams, and it is the holiday season. Uh, Is this a time of year when folks need to be on their toes a little bit more? Well, people really do need to be on their toes uh, right around the holidays because this is the uh, biggest time of the year for charitable donations. And every time you have people donating uh, to a charity of their choice, the scam artists are out there trying to steal. So uh, with greater contributions comes greater theft. And it's sad to have to say that, but it is true. So we urge people to be very careful about the decisions they make. If you're going to contribute to a charity, we think that's a great thing, but people have to pay very close attention. And you want to make sure that when you choose a charity, uh, know that the dollars are going toward the underlying purpose, that they're not being sent, spent just solely on administrative uh, costs. And you want to make sure that any of these other uh, requests that come in, these solicitations, that you thoroughly research them so you know that you're not wasting your money or you're not getting that money stolen. So this is an important time of year. Just do a little bit of research. Call our office, and we try to provide as much information as possible to help people ensure they're not getting money stolen from them. Mr. Gilstrap. Morning, Patrick. Uh, Nice to hear from you. It's always nice to talk to you. Uh, I want to shift over to the gubernatorial uh, uh, candidacy and and the, the campaign. There was a debate last week of the most of the gubernatorial candidates, and there seemed to be an empty chair. I'm curious, what was your... Why were you not there? Why did you choose not to attend? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So a couple things. Uh, I had called and our team had asked to change the date of the debate. And we had suggested holding a series of three debates after the filing deadline. And let me explain to the public why. In this race, there have already been people that have dropped out and they've moved on to different races. J.B. McCuskey, who's running for attorney general, is one example that he's running for AG. He was running for governor, and he stepped away. There may be more people entering the race and running for governor. And so I don't know why you do something five and a half months before an election. So my first observation was, let's do it when people are really focusing on the race and they get more benefit out of it. That was the first piece. Second, Um, I had asked and had my team asked to have some input in the rules about uh, how the debate would go on, because I don't think it's right if um, you have all these candidates show up. I think candidates at least should have some input. I think that certainly is uh, helpful and important. That's the way a lot of other debates work. And there was no interest expressed in working at all on that. And those were two questions we asked. And uh, the answer was no. And I said, well, look, I'm going to be eager to debate these guys. I feel really good about the matchups against these folks because I'm the only proven conservative with a record of getting big things done for our state. And I think that you'll see when we eventually do have debates, there's a big difference between their background, their record, and my record of getting huge things done for our state. But for heaven's sakes, it's December. It's right before the holidays. And I don't know how many people even saw it or listened to it. And so I decided that it would be best to do it after the filing deadline. I'm eager to do it. I've challenged my opponents uh, for at least three debates, and I'm hopeful that that will occur. So that's what happened. And uh, then I ended up doing uh, a exclusive interview with uh, the HD media folks uh, down in Charleston. And so there's a lengthy interview with, quite frankly, a lot tougher questions than what you saw during the debate. And Uh, We went into the lion's den to a media outlet that is not typically favorable toward me. But it's because I want to tell people this is about um, ensuring that there are fair rules 
and that the media treats people fairly and that uh, the most amount of people have a chance to listen and get to know all the candidates. And uh, unfortunately, that debate didn't accomplish that. And I'm hopeful that uh, there'll be other opportunities to do that. You've spoken of rules at least twice in, in within the last couple of minutes. What kind of rules are you looking for? Well, yeah, no, first, let me give you an example. So we have been contacted by no fewer than 10 or 15 different entities. County parties want to do it. State party wants to be involved. Uh, virtually every media outlet wants to be involved. Practically, you can't do that. You have to have some rules because they're logically, there's usually going to be about two or three debates in a race. It's not going to be 20 debates. So when you look at that and you say, okay, well, then where should they be? Okay, well, there's a geographic question. What time should it be? What's the format of it? And will the candidates have some input in that? Because, for instance, if you're going to have three debates, it might make sense to organize the debates in different topics, or it may make sense to have three debates in different regions of the state. All logical things, and I come to this in good faith, willing to talk and work with anyone, but it's got to make sense, and there's no separate debate commission here in West Virginia. So the other guys just accepted whatever the media uh, said that they wanted to do, and that's just not how um, I think anyone should work. The media doesn't set the rules. It should be a process, a reasonable discussion about uh, time and date and location and how the format's going to operate. It would seem that, you know, from I don't disagree with any of that, but as as a voter, as a as a resident of the state, I think there's something attractive about the spontaneity of a no rules kind of debate. As long as people don't shout over each other, the, 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 <laughs> that's just annoying. But to to have I understand having um, where are they going to be located because the big state. Right. But in terms you want to limit the topics that can be asked or the no, length I mean, of time I, I people think, can speak or what? I, I'll give you an example. So. Uh, that was set. The date was there was no flexibility. They say December 7th, take it or leave it. That's just that's not right. I, I don't think that you want to have that. Uh, I think reasonably we could have had a series of debates. We still can. I hope we will. I think that in another month or two, people will hear some of the debates get scheduled and this won't be an issue. But I think that when you set something that far out, uh, it just doesn't make any sense because we don't know the candidates. Who gets to pick who will be at the debates? That's another question. At the time they picked, there were uh, two of the four people that they invited were in single digits, right? So who decides who's going to be debating and who's not? Is that just solely up to one media entity to make that decision? Should it be decided uh, by candidates, by party? Who makes those decisions? And I think those are all very legitimate questions because there are people that get left out. Um, undoubtedly, and I think that's something that has to get factored in. Patrick, there's been some criticism of the fees being paid to attorneys out of the settlement for the opioid uh, lawsuits that came to fruition and ultimately resulted in the creation of the West Virginia First Foundation. Can you address that? Because I think your office and you specifically had a lot to do with who got what in terms of compensation. Well, so We've been very clear that uh, we wanted to have the lowest possible fees and the best possible result, and that's exactly what happened with respect to the state-based fees. So uh, my office negotiated the best uh, outside counsel fee rate in the nation, and it wasn't even close. So that's good, and we got the best results, we think. I mean, whether you think we're number one per capita or two in some cases, but we had just a lot of cases. We're the clear number one, the best settlements coming on in the entire country. And so we did our part in the AG's office. Now, the counties and cities took a different approach, and they paid a a much, much higher rate for their lawyers. And obviously, we all worked together, and a lot of people did a lot of really good work. So I'm not criticizing the work we did, because we ultimately got the best results in the country, which I think was terrific. But um, I thought that the overall fee amount should be lower, and that the state model was phenomenal because it was a reasonable fee level for a great result. Unfortunately, uh, the decisions that were made allowed for a much higher amount to go to the counties and cities in terms of fees. Uh, So I publicly and formally disagreed with that and weighed in and uh, urged the court to go in a different direction. Um, They didn't. So uh, we're going to continue to push to make sure that everyone gets the benefit of the 
state-based uh, fee process where you can do things, I think, for a bit less money but still get some great results. Our competitive bidding system has worked phenomenally well. Um, I think that the counties would benefit from something like that, too. Uh, but that's not what the law is right now that's in place. So I think that's what happened. So I think some of the people making comment either are doing it for political reasons or uh, they just don't know what the law is. But uh, I'm really proud of our office for negotiating the lowest fee and the best results. And I'll take that any day of the week. I was asked to ask you this question in regards to age caps for law enforcement officers. There's a drafted bill in the House to get rid of the age caps. Will you support it? Look, I'm happy to take a look at it. I haven't seen any specific legislation on that. And so uh, if someone wants to share it, this would be a good example of a legislature should probably share it with our office in advance. And then uh, if people want us to weigh in, we can we can take a close look at that. But I'm I'm happy to evaluate anything that folks have and and try to weigh in. I mean, I will say this. Yes, we need to make sure we're addressing um, the law enforcement needs of the eastern panhandle and the whole state. And I get very, very worried in terms of the availability to fill the openings in the sheriff's offices Mm -hmm. and to have adequate state police and others. So I think that uh, that's really important. And I've always stood strong with the men in blue. Final word is yours, Patrick. Just want to thank people for the really positive reception when I was out at the parades uh, last weekend. That was a lot of fun. And the office is going well. We're continuing to push back and sue the heck out of the by demonstration and went on a wide variety of cases. <laughs> We're in the middle of our big case. We've got the Raekwon battle and the NCAA case. Uh, there's going to be a hearing tomorrow morning and on our temporary restraining order because we think that the NCAA has not followed antitrust laws, and we're pressing forward on that. Uh, we'll have a lot of big announcements in the upcoming weeks on a number of different cases and uh, just appreciate coming on today and uh, working really hard as the state attorney general. Good to talk with you again, sir. And if we don't talk to you before Christmas, have a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you and to everyone listening. Thank you.